And the reason I chose these words is this, is that we often come upon situations in our life that seem extremely difficult. What are we going to do? We're between a rock and a hard place, or as we're going to see in the story this morning, we're between the Egyptians who are pursuing us and this water that's in front of us, a mountain that's on the side of us, and we don't know what to do or where our salvation is going to come from. And it's real easy to start with our feelings. I feel real bad about that situation. And because of that, the facts of the situation seem to change the things that I perceive instead of the things that are in actuality. And because of that, it destroys my faith. But the way it's supposed to be is we start with facts. The facts is this for the Egyptians or for the, uh, the Israelites. They are God's people and he said he is going to deliver them. Their faith should have been that however God decides to do that is up to him, but he promised it and so it's going to come to pass. So my feelings are this, I'm going to be just fine because God has promised. But if we get that out of order and we put our feelings, the things that I feel about my situation, if that comes first, it's going to have a devastating effect upon my, the facts of the situation and especially my faith in my God. And so that's why we're going to be talking about it this morning. So open your Bibles to Exodus 13. Exodus chapter 13, and we're going to go through the story of what happens on this particular day. You've probably heard of the, the little boy in Bible class, that after Bible class he comes out and he, he tells his mom uh, what he learned in Bible class that morning and said, you know, that Pharaoh was trying to attack the, the Israelites, and so they called in this F-15 strike and destroyed all the army, and they used these bombs and missiles to come in and destroyed all of them, and there's this, this huge war that happened. And, he's, and the mother said, really, that's what you were taught? He said, well, not really, but if I told you what the Bible said, you wouldn't believe it. <laughs> and that's kind of what this story is like. It's one of those amazing accounts that happens. But in chapter 13, one of the things that we'll see is that God is the one who actually charts their course. Uh, in Exodus chapter 13, verses 17 and 18, it says that it came to pass when Pharaoh had let the people go, that God did not lead them by the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. For God said, lest perhaps the people change their minds when they see war and return to Egypt. So God led the people around by the way of the wilderness of the Red Sea, and the children of Israel went up in orderly ranks out of the land of Egypt. This is at the end of the ten plagues. And after all these plagues have happened, Pharaoh has decided, I'm going to let the people go. But God doesn't lead them by the most direct course. And you've seen the different maps that show how they could have been there in a very short amount of time. But instead, he leads them by this long way. One of the things that we often we need to understand about God is that God is the one who decides the course that you need to take in life. He's the one who charts that course. And that if you go by the way that seems the easiest for you and use your own wisdom and intellect in that, as the Israelites may have been prone to do, you're, you may see some things and encounter some things that God doesn't want you seeing and encountering. Either because that's not where you're supposed to be or because your faith just isn't strong enough to face those types of things right now. And with the Israelites, that's exactly where they were. God could have sent them by the, the short route. God could have sent him, them on a direct course. But God knew that if they went there, they would be prone to turn back because they would see the wars and the different things, and they weren't prepared for that right now. And so in places like Romans chapter 5, which is a very interesting passage of Scripture, it along with many talk about the, the course that we're supposed to take to this place called hope. So let's go to Romans chapter 5. Keep your marker there in Exodus. But turn to Romans chapter 5. At the end of what we're going to be reading, verses uh, 3 and 4 of Romans 5, at the very end of it is hope. And verse 5 says that hope does not disappoint. So that is our destination that Paul is talking about here. When you're justified by faith, the destination that you're looking forward to, your promised land, as it were, is this concept of hope that does not disappoint. A real living hope. But this is how you get there. You don't take a direct course. And it's not something that's easy. But he says in verse 3, not only that, but we also glory in tribulations. Knowing that tribulation produces perseverance. Perseverance, character. And character, hope. The course that God takes you and the course that God has charted for you to make it to this destination of hope is going to be filled with some conflict. And as someone once put, without persecution, there is no hope. Without trouble, there is no hope. You have to go through this process first and foremost. That doesn't always make sense to us. Why doesn't God just give us hope from the beginning? That after all, I was baptized, I was released from my sins. How come I don't have this hope then? Paul says you have to develop that. 
And it only comes after you've developed some other things, not the least of which is character. God is also not just the one who charted that course, but He's also the one that led them. If you go back to Exodus 13, Exodus 13, notice verses 21 and 22 of Exodus 13. The Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, so as to go by day and night. He did not take away the pillar of cloud by day or the pillar of fire by night from before the people. That, that's one of the things I would love to have seen as well. What did this cloud and what did this fire look like? And God was giving them this light for them at all times, this, this symbol of his presence with them. If you look uh, later in the book of Exodus, you'll see that when the, the people would move from place to place, God always had this glory above his tabernacle also. And this was something that it says that the people did not move unless that moved. So the people never went ahead until God told them it was okay to move ahead. They always stayed where God wanted them to stay until God said, I want you to go somewhere else. And that's a great lesson in and of itself as well. In 2 John verses 9 through 11, you remember that it says that whoever goes beyond or transgresses does not abide in the doctrine of Christ, does not have God. That he who does these things doesn't have the, the Father, he doesn't have the Son. And this is the kind of person that says in 2 John verse 11, you should not even accept them into your house or bid them Godspeed because they are evil. And by bidding them Godspeed, you share in their evil deeds. It's a great lesson for us to learn as well. Don't go beyond what God has said. This course that God has set for you is the right course. He doesn't make mistakes. And He will lead you on that course. Don't turn to the left. Don't turn to the right. If God doesn't tell you to go beyond, don't go beyond. If God wants you to stand still, stand still. But stay within that boundary that God has given. God also promised, Exodus 14, verses 3 through 8. For Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel, They are bewildered by the land. The wilderness has closed them in. Then I will harden Pharaoh's heart so that he will pursue them. And I will gain honor. Notice what God's promise is. I will gain honor over Pharaoh and over all his army that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord. And they did so. In verse 5 it says, Now it was told, the king of Egypt, that the people had fled, and the heart of Pharaoh and his servants was turned against the people. And they said, Why have we done this, that we have let Israel go from serving us? So he made ready his chariot and took his people with him. Also he took 600 choice chariots, some of the best and greatest of his chariots. And he also took all these other chariots with him, and the captains over every one of them. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he pursued the children of Israel. And the children of Israel went out with boldness. So as Israel is, is fleeing from Egypt, remember what has just happened with Pharaoh and with all of Egypt. Pharaoh's firstborn is dead. Egypt is filled with households that the firstborn has died. And these Israelite servants of theirs have been let go. So Pharaoh gets very upset. His people are very upset. And with the hatred of knowing that these people are the ones that he can blame as being responsible for the death of all these children of their people, he wants them back, or at least to destroy them. And so when he goes after them, he doesn't just take any chariots. He takes 600 of the best chariots. And then he takes all these other chariots with him so that he might run them down in this desert because it's not enough for him that they be consumed in the way. God promises in the midst of this, though, that my name will be glorified. Israel and Egypt will know that I am the true God. You remember that earlier in this, this accounting in Exodus, it says that God demonstrated his power and made war against all the gods of Egypt. And so each one of those plagues, really, if you go through a study of it, each one of those plagues is something that directly affected one of the gods that was worshipped by the Egyptians. God made war against all the gods of Egypt. And even the greatest of their gods could not save their children and hold his people captive. God had demonstrated that. 
But now God has reached that point where he's going to show the ultimate of salvation. That he's going to make a clear line of distinction between his people and the Egyptians. He's going to make that salvation complete. And he has promised that to his people. And so not only does God promise, but notice in Exodus 14 or in uh, Philippians 1 and verse 6, the same has been said for us as well. As Paul is writing to this congregation of people that he had so much joy in, in serving with and serving for them and preaching the gospel. He says in Philippians 1 and verse 6, that being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. It, it's great that God was able to, to take us out of the world and bring us into his kingdom. But think of how lonely and desperate we would be if that's where God left us. If God says, I've taken you from that place of danger and I've placed you in a place of security, I'll... You know, you work it out and, and hopefully I'll see you in the end. That would make no sense. Because along the way, we're still going to have those who are not going to be happy that we've left that old life behind. One thing that I've noticed over the years, and I can guarantee you that if you decide that you're going to make a change in your life, that I am not going to do this particular thing anymore. I'm not going to hang out with these kinds of people anymore. I'm not going to live this kind of life anymore. As soon as you make that decision, you're going to have somebody call you that you probably haven't heard from in years. You're going to have something happen that's going to remind you and bring you back to those things that you said you, you would leave behind. Because Satan may leave you alone for a short period of time, but it's only for a short period of time. And he's going to try to get you back. Guaranteed. It happens all the time. And so God is not just about saving you from your sins, but watching over you and completing the work that he began in you as well, which is a great promise that we have. But if you continue there in Exodus 14... Verses 10 through 12. Exodus 14, 10 through 12. It says that when Pharaoh drew near, the children of Israel lifted their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. So they were very afraid, and the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. Then they said to Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, have you taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why have you dealt so with us to bring us out of Egypt? Is this not the word that we told you in Egypt, saying, Let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians for it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. Notice in, in verses 10 through 12 that the people want to go back. You're going to see three very distinct statements or attitudes that are, that are displayed here. The Israelites want to go back. It would have been better if we would stayed in Egypt than that we should die in this wilderness. When they say this to Moses, what, notice what it is that Moses says in verse 13 and 14. Moses stands to the, says to the people, Do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians who you see today, you shall see again no more forever. The Lord will fight for you, and you shall hold your peace. So the people want to go back. Moses says, Stand still. But in verse 15, notice what God says. God says, Why do you cry to me? Tell the children of Israel to go forward. See, very, three very distinct things that are there and please understand that whenever we go through conflicts and trials and trouble these are the things that we deal with constantly it'd been better if I had never tried never attempted never put forth the effort it wasn't appreciated it wasn't accepted whatever it may be it'd been better if I had never even tried somebody else says well just stand still give it some time be patient and that may be some very good advice. And with Moses, I think it was good advice as well. But that patience and advice is only supposed to be short-lived because thirdly, this is what God says, move forward. Why do you keep crying out? Why do you keep coming to me, asking me for all these things, all this deliverance, all this salvation? I said I'm going to save you. Tell the people to move forward. Okay, there's a lot of water out there. And we're being pursued. But have you forgotten already what God has done? Have you forgotten the plagues that were on Egypt? Have you forgotten that you were sent out with this great bounty? Have you forgotten the cloud? Have you forgotten the fire? Have you forgotten all of those things? Stand still, Moses says, and see the salvation of the Lord. Unless I'm mistaken, this is only the second time that the word salvation has been used in the scriptures thus far. It's used once in Genesis and then here. But from this point forward, you'll read this word salvation, even in the Old Testament, numerous times. 
And many of those times are used in reference to this scene. To remind Israel, God saved you. He is your rock and your salvation. He is the one who delivered you from the hand of the Egyptians. And he tells them that over and over again. And they remind each other of this over and over again. Do you not remember that day? Our fathers told us about this. It's been handed down from our grandfathers even that God saved us that day. This is that great turning point where God made complete and ultimate what his salvation was all about. But God also followed through with his promise. Verses 19 through 31 the angel of the Lord who went before the camp of Israel moved and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud went from before them and stood behind them. So it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. So it was that this cloud and that darkness to the one and it gave light by night to the other so that the one did not come near the other all that night. Then Moses stretches out his hand in verse 21 over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night and made the sea into dry land, and, and the waters were divided. I've, I've often wondered, what was that like? On that day when, when that cloud moved and that angel moved, and there's this darkness on one side and light on the other. And so if you're one of the Egyptians and you're on that other side and you can't see the Israelites, and it is dark, and all that night all you hear is this huge, mighty wind. And I would imagine that water being moved probably made some noise as well. And so what are you thinking? We know what they were thinking because they say it in the next few verses. So the children of Israel went into the, the midst of the sea on the dry ground, and the waters were a wall to them on the right hand and on the left. And the Egyptians pursued and went after them in the midst of the sea, all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots and horsemen. Now it came past in the morning watch that the Lord looked down upon the army of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and cloud, and he troubled the army of the Egyptians. And he took off their chariot wheels so that they drove them with difficulty. And the Egyptians said, Let us flee from the face of Israel, for the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. What did God say he was going to get? Glory. Would the Egyptians know who the true God is? Yes. I don't know how it is that God took off all the chariot wheels. That was something that's always stood out to me. So as I was reading commentaries about this and what many people think, is that you know, the children of Israel walked through on this dry ground. But the Egyptians drove with much difficulty because their wheels were off. That doesn't seem very smart for a people that seem very advanced for their time. But what most commentators believe is that when this wall of fire and, and, uh, or this cloud between them and the walls of water that were there, the Israelites go through and that God probably caused this great di uh, deluge of water to come down out of the sky. Psalm 77 seems to suggest that as well. And so it may not be that the tires themselves were off of the chariots, but they were figuratively off the chariots because there was nothing but mud and muck now. And so they drove them with much difficulty. How is it that these people walked across there so easily and now our chariots are stuck in this mud? Being stuck in the mud also prevents them from running. And so God has them exactly where he says they're going to be. Moses said, you will not see their face anymore after this day. And so when you continue in that text in verse 26, Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea, that the waters may come back upon the Egyptians, on their chariots and on their horsemen. Moses stretches out his hand in verse 27, And when the morning appeared, the sea returned to its full depth, while the Egyptians were fleeing into it. So the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea, and the waters returned and covered the chariots, the horsemen, and the, all the army of Pharaoh that came into the sea after them, not so much as one of them remained. But the children of Israel had walked on dry ground in the midst of the sea, and the waters were a wall on them on their right hand and on their left. So the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Thus Israel saw the great work which the Lord had done in Egypt. So the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and his servant Moses. And then chapter 15 is, is a song of praise and glory about what God had done. It's one of those accounts in the scriptures that where God just shows just how great and powerful he is. And so just a few lessons from, from this. Whenever it is that you find yourself caught in a, in a bad situation, there's a few things that we can learn from this story that we need to learn. One of them we saw in the song that we sang a little while ago about being still and knowing that the Lord is God. Knowing who he is. That God is a great God. He is awesome and powerful and mighty. God is faithful 
to everything that he says he's going to do. And God cares about his people. And we see that throughout the scriptures. We see that with the Israelite children, and it's something that we can trust in today. So whenever it is that you find yourself in a, in a bad situation, notice what is said back in Exodus 14, verses 13 and 14 again. Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. Do not start with your feelings. Don't think about how you feel first. Do not be afraid. Psalm 23 verse 4 says, Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. And you remember why? For you are with me. Your rod and your staff comfort me. Do not start with your feelings. Instead, start with the facts. The facts of the case are this. Don't be afraid. Stand still and see who it is that you are serving. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Stand still and see what it is that God would have you to know. That He is a great God. His name will be exalted among all the nations. He has done battle against all the so-called gods of the world and has defeated all of them. Stand still and see. We tell our kids that all the time. Would you be still? <laughs> because that's what happens a lot with us. We're doing so many things. There's so many activities going on. There's so many things that can, that can consume our minds. We need to be still and focus on something. Don't focus on your feelings. Focus on the facts and see the salvation that the Lord provides. Hold your peace, he says, on top of that. Hold your peace, he says at the end of verse 14. The Lord will fight for you, and you shall hold your peace. Psalm 131 and verse 2. Psalm 131 and verse 2. It's a beautiful verse. Here the psalmist says in Psalm 131 verse 2, Surely I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with his mother, like a weaned child is my soul within me. The image here is of a child that's been hungry. And you know when that child is hungry and wants something to eat, there is no saying to that child, be still, be quiet. That kid is going to scream and make noise until it is weaned. But when that child is weaned and received what it is it's been crying out for, that child is content and happy and this thing that you were hearing a few moments ago is now the most precious and beautiful and cutest thing you've ever seen because they've been quieted by something that's fulfilling. We have to be still so that we can see what it is that God provides for us. But once we see what it is that God has provided for us, be quiet. Be at peace. Purposely be quiet and be at peace. It says in Lamentation 3 and verse 26, here the great prophet says in Lamentation 3, 26, it is good that one should hope and wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. Be still and see and then hold your peace because God has promised and God will provide. And lastly, what it says in verse 15, say to the people, move forward. That's when you're ready to move forward. It's not when I feel so desperate that I have to do something. No, when you get the facts in order first. When you have the faith to believe in what God has promised, that's the moment when you know that God will provide the way of escape that you take advantage of it. That way you feel secure, you feel confident, and you feel bold. Watch, therefore, stand fast, be immovable. It says in 1 Corinthians 15, 58, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your work in the Lord is, is not in vain. So be steadfast and immovable, but always abounding while you do that. In chapter 16, verse 13, he says, watch. Some of your versions say, quit ye like men. In other words, be brave, be strong. The Bible promises this all over the place, but it's only after we understand that God is the one who provides it. And so have you found yourself in difficult situations before? Will you find yourself in difficult situations in the future? As it was with them, learn that simple lesson. And deliverance is what God provides. There's one last passage I want us to look at. And that's in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. <clears throat> and 
At the very beginning of this passage, in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 1, it says, Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea. And in verse 2 it says, All were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. That what you see is there was a cloud above them. There was water above them. There was water on both sides of them. They were completely immersed in tombs, surrounded by water. And they were baptized into their leader. We are baptized into Christ. Their salvation was not complete until that Red Sea scene when they were baptized. Our salvation is not complete until we're baptized for the remission of our sins. They were baptized into Moses, their leader. We are baptized into Christ, who is our Savior, the author and finisher of our faith. And so the question I want to leave with you this morning is, have you seen the salvation of the Lord? Have you seen that God can provide? And that when you think about the sins that's in your life, it may seem like a, a desperate situation that you don't know what to do, and that makes you feel real bad. It makes you feel desperate. Where you might try a lot of things in life. Well, try this. Be still and see what God has done for you. What He has provided. Quiet your soul, knowing that what God has promised, God will fulfill. And let God be glorified by moving forward and doing the thing that God would have you to do. If that's where you're at this morning because you need to be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins or you need to repent of sins and come back to the Lord that you might fulfill the duties that you once said that you were due, whatever that case may be, won't you please let us know as together we stand and sing.